This episode of Worldview Everlasting is brought to you by the letter AWESOME. The numbers Sweet Action and Issues Etc. Talk Radio for the Thinking Christian. Issuesetc.org. Hey Internet! Welcome to Worldview Everlasting, your favorite YouTube addiction. And on this week's edition of Greek, well, not so much Greek anymore, but New Testament Tuesday, uh, we're going to be getting into the second half of Mark chapter 13, picking up on where we left off and what we skipped from last week. Stick around. So whereas last week we looked at the entire structure of Mark chapter 13 and how it basically is Jesus answering two different questions from his disciples, which he gives two different answers to, one about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD and one about his return. And we looked at the overarching scope of what that meant for us as readers of the text. We had to, to see that structure, skip over some nuggets in there, some pieces that I don't want to really call them throwaway lines, but they're lines that weren't quite connected to the immediate structure of either the temple and like warnings about what's going to happen right before the temple is destroyed or the no one knows stuff about the end of time. These nuggets do apply across time and space to basically everybody. So what we're going to do this week is go back and we're going to pick up on a couple of those and just riff on them momentarily. Excellent! The first of these ideas is that false teachers are the greatest threat to the church. In verse 5, Jesus began to say to them, See that nobody leads you astray. This is a matter that applies to Christians in every place and every time. It's a constant refrain within the New Testament and Old Testament alike that there are false teachers, that is, those who speak for the devil, not so much on purpose, but usually according to their hearts, which they think are good but aren't actually good, and that these people who would lead you astray from God, his actual word, and his salvation, not only are to be found in the world, but in fact are to be found in the church. That is in the place where God actually is. They take their seat in the midst of holiness, pretending to be holy ones. And Jesus says, be careful. As time goes on, whether it's about the destruction of the temple or whether it's about the end of time, there's going to be those out there leading you astray from what Jesus has said in every way, shape, and form. The second interesting idea is that the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which in St. John's apocalypse are often thought to be things that are going to come at the end of the world, are not in fact things that are going to come at the end of the world. St. John's apocalypse apocalypse like Matthew 24 and like Mark 13 are largely about temporal present circumstances of those who heard those books originally written to them that then have application for us. And those four horsemen are a description of the things that the fall sent upon us, which we should expect to be here from the beginning to the end of the fallen world throughout time and space. So Jesus also says in verse 7, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places, there will be famines, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. These are but the beginning of birth pains, yeah? So when Adam fell, he brought all kinds of decay and destruction on this planet that things like great wars, famines, earthquakes, all of this is part of the planet in travail, struggling with its own sin, which once was a death throw, but in Christ, of course, has become the beginning of a new birth. And so the creation is groaning with eager expectation, waiting for the future to be revealed. But none of these things are signs that the end is actually present, right? Just as false teachers aren't in fact a sign of the end of the world, the idea that there are anti-Christians, anti-Christs out there speaking against Christianity from within the church is not a sign of the final end of the world about to be around the corner. Neither are any of these other things. But there are many pieces of destruction that go on throughout the history of humanity. The third point that Jesus leaves us in Mark 13 is in verse 10, that the gospel, the forgiveness of sins which Jesus came and was about to purchase on the cross for us is the real point. It's the real thing that matters, not pinning the tail on the Antichrist, nor trying to figure out when the day of judgment's going to be. Verse 10, he says, the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. This is not a matter of once we get the gospel proclaimed every different language out there, then therefore Jesus will come back. No one knows the day or the hour when Jesus will come back. His point is, what do I want you to worry about? I don't want you to worry about the wars. I want you to worry about false teachers, but they're not like a sign of anything. If you want to focus on something, get the forgiveness of sins proclaimed to all nations. Get it 
out there. And in the midst of this, this decay and destruction, wars, rumors of wars, false teaching, but the gospel being confessed, know this fourth point, that blood relation means nothing unless it is Jesus' blood. Verse 12, he warns us, brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father, his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. Now, that's some terrifying stuff. This is not something that's easy for we Americans to deal with. Are you telling me that my children are not more important than your children? How can you say that? Look how special they are. What darlings, you know? Of course, they're all going to be rock stars and geniuses and all this stuff. But Jesus actually says, no, 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 no. The only blood relation that matters is the blood relation of those who feast on the blood of the new man who has risen from the dead. And in that, you must expect that even within your family, you will have people who are your enemies precisely for the sake of what Christ has said and done, which you as a believer refuse to let go of, but which they want you to let go of for their own self-justifying uh, animosity toward God, basically. It's not that we want to pray for our children to fall away or for our families to be divided, but it is that we are to expect it. And when it does happen, blood should not be thicker than water in the sense that your family should not matter as much to you as the word of God. And see, he's told you ahead of time before it takes place so that it doesn't surprise you when it does. Point number five is the apocalyptic style of the the entire section. He says in verse 19, in those days, there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. But in those days after that, verse 24 goes on, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light. Verse 25, and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Now, given that Jesus is about to go on and say that all of this is going to happen before the generation in front of him dies, we talked about that part last week, this has led to not a few modern day rationalistic atheists saying, look, Jesus was a liar, he was full of mistakes, see, the sun is not dark and the moon is not blood. This should have happened before all those people died and it clearly didn't happen so see christianity is a bunch of bogus bahooey right hey haters and many Christians, sadly, they don't go that route, but then they start looking for these signs, the whole blood moon phenomenon for the last year. It's just a complete joke. The problem is what's lost is the understanding of what's called apocalyptic language. This is a particular style of prophetic discourse or writing that arose at a certain time in history, namely right before the exile of Judah into Babylon during the intertestamental period and then also during the Christian age, in which prophets tended to speak in a sort of code language where they weren't necessarily being literal about the images they were using so much as literally trying to convey to you the actual idea of what those images represented. And those images often and usually were pictures from the Old Testament narrative, which they were employing to make a bigger point about the future. So that Rome is represented as Babylon and sin is represented as Egypt and things like that. And Jesus here in this section is very much picking up on that apocalyptic language. So that when he says at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem, there will arise a great tribulation such as has never been. He's speaking in what we would normally call hyperbole, meaning that it will be as bad as it's ever going to get, right? It's not like we're on this measuring scale where God's in heaven. He's like, well, this one's going to be the worst one. And that one will be the second worst desolation ever. And this will be the third worst desolation. It's not working out that level. He's saying it's going to be really, 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 really bad, right? That's the point. And so bad, so tumultuous, it will be as if the sun won't ever give its light. Because for the modern day Jew, the second temple Jew, the idea that there could be no temple was like worse than there being no sun. Take away the sun, leave me the temple, right? That's the point that he's getting at. Apocalyptic language. You can look it up. Next point. Interesting nugget, a bit of a throw to the side. Who are the angels and is this still apocalyptic language? In verse 27 when he says, he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven, right? Is he talking about the return of Jesus to bring everybody to himself? The problem is this is all before that, that day language. It's still in the those day language. So I tend to think this is still apocalyptic language, just like the angels in the early part of the book of Revelation have been understood to be the seven pastors who were in the midst of the seven churches that the letters are being written to. I tend to think that these angels he's talking about here are the representatives of him at first, the apostles themselves, 
Testament, then that pastoral office being sent with the word of God to preach this gospel to every corner, to every end, in every direction, to the vast extremes of the earth. And that this is his gathering of the elect, that this would take place, in fact, before the generation of the disciples had disappeared. And if you look at the history of the book of Acts, that's exactly what happened, yeah? Now, he also does make the claim that the destruction of Jerusalem will not be a hidden thing. It's going to be obvious. You're not going to be able to miss it when it happens. The gates have been broken down before, and so he actually says these gates are about to be broken down again, just like they were before when Babylon came and tore it down the first time. He says in verse 28, from the fig tree, learn this lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and it puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you, and remember who are the yous, when you disciples and those you're teaching and talking to directly, when you see these things I've warned you about taking place among you, you know that he, your destruction of the temple from Rome, but from Jesus, who's ascended to the right hand of the Father and sending this as judgment, he is near at the very gates. And those gates of Jerusalem really cannot be misunderstood. The point of the fig tree is that it will be so obvious to those Christians who were alive at that time that this was coming, that they would be able to get out of town and escape the judgment itself, which we know from history actually happened. They left Jerusalem before the Roman armies got there, even though the zealots were still there using the temple as their barricade, as their fortress, and Rome tore it down. You got a really weird throwaway line in verse 32 that not even the son will know about his own return. He says, concerning that day, right, the day of the return, that hour, nobody knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. And here arises the great question of the Trinity and the mystery of the incarnation. How is it possible for Jesus, who is God, who is omniscient, to know everything and yet not know something? And it's a great and grand mystery. But I will say this, it's quite interesting that you can't forget about something on purpose, right? Don't think about pink elephants. See, you can't actually do it, but God is so God, he can forget something if he wants to. It's actually what he does with your sins, which is pretty kind of sweet. Next point, Jesus gives us a little parable about sleeping, which is to not believe that the end of the world is coming and how this is a dangerous thing. That the truly asleep Christian is not the one who isn't perfecting his life, but the one who thinks that this life is what life is all about, as opposed to the destruction of this life and the coming of the next one. Verse 34, it's like a man going on a journey when he leaves his home and puts his servants in charge each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, you implied, and here it is, everybody, you stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, which is, again, the whole no one knows the day or the hour. We have no idea when Jesus is returning. It could be at any time, lest he, that's Jesus, returning the final time, come suddenly and find you asleep. What I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. That is, don't put your hope in this life. Don't put your hope in your own justification. Put your hope in what Jesus was about to then go accomplish on the cross, which is the whole point, the gospel, what it's all really pointing to. Don't focus on princes and temples and presences now. Focus on his word and the life of the world to come. The forgiveness of sins achieved by his blood as he died and rose in your place. Rock on. The four horsemen of the apocalypse that we see in St. John, which are often also understood to be end of times things. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs>